Our final panel is the panel on Trouble in the Headlines. And our panel chair is uh, Dr. Eamon Darcy uh, of uh, Maynooth University. Eamon? Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, there you are. Right. Um, uh, thank you very much. So, first up, we have uh, Dr. Leanne uh, Blaney. Uh, with, uh, I think, one of the more interesting, uh, one of the most interesting titles of the paper I've ever heard, uh, What a Car Crash, a bit risky of a title. Um, but yes, uh, uh, Dr. Bailey specialises in um, technology and transportation in 19th and 20th century uh, British uh, uh, and Irish society and adding further nuance to our understanding of the post-war period in particular. So I'll hand over to you, Dr. Bailey. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eamon. I um, apologize in advance. I think I may have jinxed myself because I titled this What a Car Crash and I'm now about to try and share a screen to make sure that my PowerPoint works. So let's, let's hope, fingers crossed, that this is not a car crash indeed. Um, okay, let me just set this up. Perfect. That's the first win of this presentation before I go any further is that we have got screen working. So I'm, I'm delighted, guys, regardless of how this goes for me, I'm delighted that this worked for me, so all good. All right, let's begin. The arrival of the motor car on Irish shores in 1896 set the wheels in motion, pardon the pun, for a disruption of the traditional social order of roads, the transformation of social practices, the alteration of urban planning, and the revision of long-held concepts of time, distance, and travel. Yet, on that spring morning in 1896, as the steam-powered Serple, a forerunner of the modern-day Peugeot for the car enthusiasts amongst us, trundled along the rough dirt roads along the outskirts of Lisburn, no one could scarcely have imagined that 20 years later, in 1916, this new form of transport would actively cause 159 fatal road accidents and 1,461 non-fatal road accidents. A remarkable figure given that by 19... Many of the 6,549 motor cars reg registered on the island had been either forced off the road owing to World War I fuel restrictions or had been commandeered by both the military and the local authorities on the grounds of firstly war work and secondly as a safety precaution against Irish rebels who had been engaged in organising and staging the Easter Rising. Now consider the fact that in 2018, statistics recorded that the Republic of Ireland had reached a new peak, with approximately 2.13 million registered vehicles on the roads. Road fatalities for 2019 recorded 149 people dying in 138 road accidents, and in 2020, 140 people dying in 129 field road accidents. In simple terms, this means that in spite of the population of contemporary Ireland now being in excess of 1.8 million people greater than in 1913, the number of cars and roads having increased by 3,000% in the last century, an advanced democratisation of drivers across Irish society, the years 1913, 1916, 1919, 1920 and 1921 recorded more fatal road accidents occurring on the roads of Ireland than in the last two years of the 21st century. Therefore, harnessing our comprehension of how news of traffic accidents and road fatalities is consumed in this, the arguably technological age, it is interesting to turn our attention to how news of road accidents and fatalities were reported and interpreted by early 20th century Irish society. To begin with, it's important to provide a brief overview of the history of the motor car in Ireland. As aforementioned, 1896 witnessed the arrival of the first few cars into Ireland. Technically, the automobiles which we now associate as the forerunners of the modern motor car had been invented in the 1880s by European engineers such as Carl Benz and Gottlieb Demmler. However, Britain, and to a lesser extent Ireland, had been reluctant to encourage independent motoring, as it seemed a likely challenge to the established monopoly on transportation which the railways had created during the early Victorian age. That changed once Belfast-based vet John Boyd Dunlop reinvented the pneumatic rubber tyre in 1888. Recognising the potential market for such a wheel against, amongst the British and Irish cycling fraternity, Dunlop and Harvey de Croo, a prominent cyclist and at the time the president of the Irish Cyclist Association, 
founded the Pneumatic Tire and Booths Cycle Agency Company in Stephen Street in Dublin. These rubber wheels revolutionised both the cycling and motoring world as they made it possible for riders and drivers to enjoy smoother rides, which enabled greater speeds to be achieved. Consequently, by 1896, Westminster had to capitulate to the demands of the speed enthusiasts, which numbered a significant number of MPs amongst their lot, and the Light Locomotives on the Highway Act was passed. This act removed the need for locomotives to be restricted to speed limits less than 14 miles per hour, and the legal obligation that the locomotive could only be driven if an individual walked in front of the vehicle waving a red flag. Prospective Irish motorists who had previously been reluctant to invest substantial funds in purchasing a form of transport, which they couldn't really avail of, were now in the position to do so and readily did. For context, motor cars cost approximately £500 at this stage, which is the equivalent of a senior doctor's uh, yearly wage. The first Irish motorists were wealthy, educated, predominantly with either a medical or an engineering background, and many had previously been enthusiastic cyclists. Two such individuals were RJ, editor of the Irish Wheelman, and Alfred Harmsworth, more frequently known by his title, Lord Northcliffe, the founder of the Daily Mail. McCready, a successful competitive cyclist, had been wholly against what he termed oil pots, until a fateful trip with the Australian motorist Selwyn Edge convinced him of the error of his ways. By 1900, he would found the Motor News, Ireland's first motoring journal aimed at encouraging and educating Irish motorists. Harmsworth, meanwhile, demonstrating the same business acumen which had aided his evolution from a penniless teenage journalist editing the Bicycling News, was quick to encourage and include motor reporting within the pages of his newly launched newspaper, The Daily Mail, in 1896. Aimed at being essentially the busy man's paper, Harmsworth and his brothers had set out to produce a paper that embraced modernity and made full use of modern technologies, such as photography and telegram, enabling his university educated young male journalists to roam far and wide to cover interesting and engaging newsworthy stories. Often these stories related to either British high society, sport or crime. As such, road accidents and their associated court cases were the perfect fodder. As you would expect, during the initial pre-war period, the coverage of motoring accidents by both editors tended to be rather tame. The two friends and fellow motoring enthusiasts were keen to encourage automobility and sought to focus on the positives which motoring offered the, the wider public. Therefore, tales of motoring accidents could often be presented in an affable manner. Take this account of a motor accident in May 1914, covered by McCready's The Motor News. It recalled how a party of Belfast motorists came upon a rather extraordinary accident at Julianstown, which is between Balbriggan and Rahada for the Irish amongst us. They saw a motor car stopped, but with the engine still running. The left-hand front mudguard was badly broken, and close by was a horse attached to a car and trap, steady on three legs, the fourth leg being completely severed below the knee. The article contains no reference to either the driver of the motor car or of the horse's owner and as readers were left in the dark about what the eventual outcome of the accident was. Usually in such instances, when the motorist was found accountable, they would pay a fair sum to the owner of the injured animal as compensation, and then the injured animal would be put down. By modern standards, this seems to lack empathy for the horse. But at the time, horses were effectively considered a mode of transport, akin to a bicycle or a motor car. In fact, one of the selling points of motor cars was that they were considered safer than the friend of man, which had been found in one national health safety report to have been responsible for causing, on average, one fatal death of a human per day during the year 1904, while being utilised as transit. Where these periodicals did demonstrate notable sympathy was in the instances that a serious motor accident was caused by someone that was still, that was well known within the relatively small motoring community. This is evident in a Christmas edition of the Motor News, which recorded a sad motor accident in Dublin, whereby Miss Perry of Fox Rock was the innocent cause of the death of an old woman named Mary Bolger. The report goes on to state how numerous witnesses could testify that Miss Perry, an extraordinarily cautious and considerate driver, had been driving at a very slow pace when Mary, described as an old woman over 80 years of age who was blind in one eye and had a cataract in the other, 
crossed the road despite a nearby tram sounding its warning that she was not safe to do so. Miss Perry apparently jammed on her brakes, but owing to wet conditions, her efforts proved futile and the car knocked the old woman over. One of the wheels went over her chest, breaking her ribs and killing her instantly. Miss Perry was described as being prostrated with grief, although the article was swift to point out that neither the jury, the subsequent court case, nor any of their readership would consider that she had any grounds for self-reproach. The notion that motor cars were often the fault of pedestrians who had little knowledge or understanding of the complexities of motoring was one that would prevail in both the national and international press throughout the 1920s and into what some motor historians have termed the murderous 30s on a kind of substantial number of the road fatalities recorded. National governments, including the newly established Stormont government and the Free State, found themselves in a difficult position. On the one hand, a dire need of financial capital, the income generated by motor taxation and associated fuel taxes, not to mention the importation taxes on foreign built cars, was readily needed to finance the running of these burgeoning states. Keen to encourage the establishment of new industries that would promote employment, both governments were eager to encourage and promote the emerging motor industry and its subsidiaries, including motor garages and oil companies, as well as the second-hand motor trade and the completely knocked down CKD industry, which emerged in the free state as a result of the economic war. They were therefore understandably quite reluctant to engage in imposing restrictions or threatening heavy punishments on motorists. On the other hand, they faced mounting pressure from certain areas of the national mainstream press particularly vocal in their concern about the laxity with which offending motorists was treated was the Irish Times. Traditionally, the Times papers, both the British and Irish publications, erred on the side of conservatism and preferred not to encourage mass motoring. Initially, this had been owing to the interests of the readership, who frequently had much of their own personal capital tied up in railway shares and interests. However, they were to maintain this stance as the 20th century advanced thanks to the widely held perception that cars were destructive owing to their speed and power. An idea that had been encouraged by the fact that driving as a privileged and exclusive minority was largely considered with suspicion by the rest of the public and was sustained thanks to the efforts of many amongst the media, including authors, creatives and directors who sought to entertainingly sustain this prejudice. One instance as illustrated in this particular slide was English film pioneer Cecil Hepworth, whose 1900 film, Explosion of a Motor Car, included dramatic scenes where the motor car exploded, sending body parts up into the sky before returning to the ground, showering an unfortunate policeman. This film preceded by many decades, a lot of the films that we credit with, the Hollywood films, which we credit with encouraging the concept and ideology of reckless speed merchants. On the subject of motorists being belonging to an exclusive minority and the suggestion that they were somewhat above the law, the Irish Times reported in October 1934 that the 18 year old daughter of one of Hitler's chief stormtroopers had been acquitted of a manslaughter case in Berlin. Although she had knocked down and killed a 65 year old man and had severely injured his wife and daughter at the pedestrian crossing, the German correspondent reported that the defendant's alleged defense was she had been rather in a hurry and the traffic light was green. Attributing this callous comment to the young woman did little to encourage anything but a dim view of how her father's position may have influenced the outcome of the trial. This report also had undertones of the misogyny which had crept into motoring and reports of motoring during the interwar period. Prior to the outbreak of World War I, the expense involved in owning and driving a motor car prompted the aforementioned exclusivity to motoring. As such, female drivers in these upper echelons of society were considered peers of male motorists, particularly because, especially in the early days of motoring, female ingenuity often saved the day when a motor car broke down. However, post-World War I, a prejudice arose against female motorists, who became a figure of fun and derision for male motorists and readers. Ironically, many of the males poking fun were financially handicapped and were forced, therefore, to make do with bicycles or public transport, as opposed to motor cars that the female motorists drove. 
Locally, the Irish Times turned their attention to drink driving in keeping with the growing national recognition that the issue of alcohol abuse is prevalent across all sectors of Irish society. It must be recognised that owing to the fact that a medical diagnosis of a driver being inebriated had to be secured before they could be prosecuted for drink driving, official records which attribute drink driving as the cause of motor accidents tend to be quite minimal for most of the 20th century. Instead, excessive speed and improperly overtaking as well as pedestrians being at fault, specifically young infants or the elderly, were more commonly causes given in Guardi reports. Media coverage, however, differed. The Irish Times regularly used their editorials to address the matter. Significantly throughout the 1930s, they alongside civilian groups, such as Traffic and Safety First Association of Ireland, the Association for the Prevention of Intemperance, and the Safety First Association of Ireland, campaigned for tougher custodial sentences for motorists found to be guilty of inebriated driving. The tone of disapproval is evident in many of the motor accidents covered by the papers reporters. Under the headline, Driver Did Not Remember, a Dublin District Court reporter went to great effort to detail how the defendant, William John Henderson, had got behind the wheel of his vehicle, having enjoyed a black velvet with friends at lunch. The black velvet, it transpired, was made up of two bottles of stout and a bottle of champagne. He had driven through rough mines and had been in the process of overtaking a van when his memory went blank. His next memory was awaking the following morning to find his face covered in cuts and with sore knees. Subsequently, he learned that he had acquired a concussion, a broken rib and severe bruising to his knees. He also discovered that he had been arrested for causing an accident by driving into Mrs. Annie Werner, who was badly injured as a result. Finally, before concluding, concluding, I'd like to address the coverage of motor accidents offered in the provincial and local press. As one can imagine, motor accidents formed a staple of the local news coverage, even in the cases where accidents were narrowly avoided or everyone escaped injury. The reporter went to great lengths to include all the necessary details required to conjure up an image of the incident in the reader's mind. Detailed descriptions of the background to the accident, including the necessary personal details of the parties involved, their ages, addresses and occupations were common, as was details regarding the colour of the vehicles, the make of the vehicles, occasionally a weather report, as well as direct quotes from those caught up in the accident. A classic example of this is a report from September 1953, which appeared in the Ballina Herald. Under the headline, Ballylahan Ballyla Motor Accident Has Fatal Result, the subtitle, Sad Death of Clerical Student, alluded to the rest of the report, which laid out how an unusual type of motoring accident occurred at Ballylahan Bridge, resulting in the death of Reverend Noel Rowland. Noel had been a young clerical student on leave who set out in a motor van with some neighbours to visit the Holy Shrine at Knock. Along the way, they passed under the plantation at Mr Farr's on the Foxford side of the bridge, where a recent storm had dislodged a heavy branch of a tree which fell directly on the bagel. Mrs Ellen Byrne, who had also been injured in the accident, was quoted in the article explaining that although it had been breezy as the van had passed by the plantation, no one had seen the tree branch which fell atop the roof of the van. She remembered struggling to get out of the now crushed van and having spotted Noel with a serious head injury. Poignantly, the deceased brother provided a brief description of the young man, noting that the deceased would have been 25 years old in December and that the last time he had seen him alive was on Sunday the 30th of August at a quarter to 10 o'clock, then in his usual good health. His brother, he continued, had then left in a van to go to knock. Arguably, it is these small details which are often lost in the more general reporting offered by the national and international press that have the most significant impact on us. Acting as a reminder that behind every headline and statistic about motor fatalities and accidents is a beloved loved one who will not be returning home. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll, we'll hold the questions uh, to, to the end as per usual. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity to introduce 
Our next speaker, uh, Daniel Perry, who's a PhD student at the School of Communications in DCU. And Daniel's work at the moment is focusing on the working lives of former journalists and editors, continuity and change. So Daniel, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Eamon. I'll just, um, I'll just share my screen here uh, and remember to share sound as well, because I, um, I have audio here. Now, hopefully everybody can um, can see that. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about headlines. Um, I'm a former journalist turned PhD student, and um, my focus, is, as Eamon says, is on um, the working lives of former journalists and editors in Ireland since 1950. Um, takes the form of an oral history. I've conducted 29 interviews so far. Um, I'm due to submit my PhD later this year. And um, I hope to play you some audio if the um, if the technology allows. If not, there, there will be um, transcripts that you can you can follow along with. Um, so um, I plan to explore the world of headlines over the decades in Ireland, um, touching on a couple of different aspects: the changing technology in headline writing, the mysterious language used by sub editors who are the people responsible for um, for putting headlines together the restrictions imposed on headlines by early deadlines, and the political blowback that sort of sometimes resulted from certain headlines. So one thing to keep in mind is that headlines can be misleading. Um, I was thinking about this when um, coming across J.B. Morton, the man on the right in black and white there, he wrote under the pseudonym Beachcomber, uh, a, a column for the Daily Express in the UK uh, called By The Way. Um, he wrote it for over 50 years and he gets a mention in the book by Harold Evans, the man you see on the left there, who's the former and recently deceased uh, Sunday Times editor. Evans says that reading um, Beachcomber convulsed me with insane laughter. Um, he describes it as nonsense on stilts, but comically perfect in his parodies of newspaper style. And one example he gives was 60 horses wedged in chimney was a typical Beachcomber headline followed by the story to fit this sensational headline has not turned up yet. So one thing to keep in mind, particularly if you're under a certain age, is that before the digital era, headline writing was complicated. Um, Sean Rice, the man you see in the picture here, started working in the Connacht Telegraph in Castlebar in County Mayo in 1965. And he sometimes had the job of putting headlines on the stories on the front and back pages. This involved um, using letters that were on a little wooden block, and each letter had to be physically added separately. As Sean explains, uh, this was not always a straightforward process, and um, hopefully you'll be able to, uh, to hear the audio here. You have to pick them, put them in. Well, the, <laughs> there were very, very funny times because uh, sometimes you'd write out a headline for the, the story, you know, you'd write out the headline for the story, and you'd find well, we cannot do that headline now because there are four E's in that <laughs> headline. And we have only three. <laughs> yeah. One of the other people I spoke to was John Brophy, who joined the Irish press as a copy boy in the late 1960s. He was asked by the group news editor, William Redmond, do you want to chase ambulances or do you want to sit writing headlines? Brophy's father had been a contributor to the American Catholic press. He told me that the sound of typewriters was well known as he was growing up and he had run school magazines and had some experience with headlines. So that's the option he chose. After a couple of months of making tea and running errands, he was called to the sub-editor's desk. The, the sub-editor's job had its own specifications and even its own language, um, which was often impenetrable to outsiders or to those who were hearing it for the first time. Pat Brennan, who you see in the photograph here, had worked as a reporter and editor in magazines for McGill and later Status. Uh, but she hadn't uh, any subbing experience until she joined the Irish press in 1983. And here's what she remembers of her first night on the sub-editor's desk. And I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never worked in hot metal. I'd never worked in subbing. And um, John Banville was the uh, chief sub. And I remember somebody, 
probably always Bamble, handing me a piece of copy and saying, um, I did two of 20 with, two, with the two point hood. And I thought, yeah, two of 20 with the two point hood. Whatever that means. <laughs> and, and I thought, okay, I've got to find somebody who's decent here to get the most information with asking the fewest questions to expose yourself. And what it, what it meant was it was a single column story um, and two of 20 was two decks of 20 um, point uh, headline and the two point hood was it had to be indented for a little little line to go around it like that. Dico Reardon, who you see in the middle there, uh, began uh, working in the Irish press as a copy boy like John Brophy. In his case, it was a few years earlier in the early 1960s. He was later the last editor of the Evening Press. Dick O'Reardon told me that while headlines are now often given sufficient space to include a bit of detail or complexity, that wasn't always the case. He did, some editors had a very tricky time, on, particularly on single column stories and that. And in actual fact, you could go through pay, 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 papers and see maybe the same sort of headline and, and about five different stories. Man uh, dies in crash. It restricted you the way that, that uh, newspapers were done. Some of the restrictions we operated on, and some headlines, you know, ten, three lines of ten, set, of ten letters. I mean, you can't get enough out of that, like, you know. The paper that John Brophy and Dick O'Reardon worked for, the, the Irish Press Group, had been set up in 1931 by Eamon de Valera, who had founded the Fianna Fáil political party five years earlier. The Irish press backed Fianna Fáil at every general election during the newspaper's lifetime, um, which um, spanned the, the second half and a bit of the first half of the 20th century. Links between the newspaper and the, and the party were well known by both friends and foes alike. Jim Eady, who you see on the right there holding up the miniature cup, um, worked for the Irish Independent between 1956 and 1965. Um, he remembers the Irish press giving headline coverage to a Fianna Fáil promise to drain the River Shannon. Jim Eady had included the promise in the text of his Irish Independent article, but he says he refused to headline it. The dramatic coverage that the story received in the Irish press received, led to questions at Independent headquarters on Middle Abbey Street in Dublin, but Jim Eady didn't back down when he was challenged about this by his superiors. I said, that's bullshit. I said, I come from that area. He's been promising this since I was a kid. 1932, they got elected. And they've been promising the drainage of the Shannon. And I come from Roscommon. And the farmers, ask the farmers down there. When they go to the, and they don't believe it. I said, why should we be uh, supporting this propaganda, political propaganda? The, the, the editor wants an explanation. I said, do you want it in writing? I'll give it to you in writing, I said. Is this paper is this paper going to be used as a as a mouthpiece for Fianna Fáil? Urban district councils or what were later known as town council meetings were a staple of local newspaper coverage until town councils were abolished in 2014. Terry Riley, who you see in the picture there, covered the Urban District Council in his native town of Ballina in County Mayo for two newspapers, The Western People, which he later edited and the now defunct Ballina Herald, which Leanne had also mentioned in, in her talk. Um, Riley's own father had been a councillor um, and he remembers meetings being close to the bone. Various topics of local interest were discussed, roads, roofs and housing. But Terry Riley says the underlying aim of councillors rarely varied and it often involved headlines and the search for media coverage. Excuse me. Sorry. And uh, it was who's going to outscore who on the night, because the big debate was going to be about the councillors having a sh pot, sh pot shot at the administrators. And whoever would get the best, best headline, that was our competition, you get the best headline, and to command the biggest part of the coverage. They took up pages in, in both papers, and you had the most uh, extraordinary allegations and comments and uh, way, loopy, loopy stuff and otherwise. And uh, we learned eventually, us journalists learned eventually, that if a councillor was going on for quite a long time, rehashing the same old thing over there, you put down your pen. Riley and his colleagues found that a councillor who was being ignored by the press would stop talking 
and the council could move on to the next item. Um, early deadlines can pose problems for newspapers and a headline can live in infamy if a paper gets it wrong. The picture you see here is of US President Harry S. Truman on the night of the uh, 1948 presidential election, gleefully holding up a, an early edition of the Chicago Tribune, which announced Dewey defeats Truman, which he hadn't. Truman had beaten Thomas Dewey and returned uh, as president. The, uh, the Sunday Tribune had its own taste of, of early headlines as well. In the 1980s, it had a magazine style cover um, which allowed color, which wasn't always possible in house in newspapers at the time. There was generally a strong image and a provocative headline. Pat Brennan, who worked as news editor there, said that this had some advantages. It gave the paper a standout presence on the newsstand and the magazine style cover played to the strengths of the editor, Vincent Brown. But she explains it also had disadvantages and this is tied up in early deadlines and the fact that the cover had to be printed on a Friday. But it meant that you had to make a decision early in the week to do a story that was strong enough to put on the cover. And then from Thursday night onwards, you were just hoping that something huge didn't break. A Saturday story wasn't going to end up on the front page. A Friday story wasn't going to end up on the front page either. The, the example I used was John Carlos's fantastic pictures of the, gu the guards opening fire, you know, just off O'Connell Street in Dublin. Evelyn Glenn Holmes had been let out to an IRA activist. Um, had been let out of the courts, but the guards followed her and followed her with a view to rearrest her. And um, John got these fantastic pictures. So we had the best pictures of the breaking story on a Saturday, and it was inside because the color wraparound was there. And there was no way around that. The often for people who who think about headlines, tabloid newspapers may be the first thing that comes to mind. Internationally, you, you've had headlines that went viral in an era before we used that term. In 1983, the New York Post ran the banner over its account of a grisly crime, headless body in topless bar. Three years later, The Sun in the UK ran the claim, Freddy Star ate by hamster. Uh, we probably haven't had an Irish equivalent of that, but the Irish Daily Star did go viral in its own way last April after the extension of the first lockdown. Uh, with the headline, Go Out Your Back and Tan, which is a form of wordplay based on the Irish rebel song, Come Out Ye Black and Tans. Um, the Star had run a series of controversial front pages during the economic crisis of a decade ago. In March of 2010, they ran photographs of the bankers, Sean Fitzpatrick and Michael Fingleton, with the headline, They Deserve to Be Shot, and the subheading, These Two Bastards Have Cost Us 25 Billion Euro. The following November, after the Green Party pulled out of the coalition government, the star ran a front page picture of the then Taoiseach Brian Cowan and his remaining Fianna Fáil uh, ministers with the headline, Useless Gobshites. Broadsheet headlines are often less memorable, but a, a straightforward factual headline can still tell a story in, in very stark terms. And one example of this comes from the Sunday Tribune um, from 1984 and its headline, Girl 15 dies after giving birth in a field. This was the story of Anne Lovett, the 15 year old uh, and her stillborn baby who died in Granard in County Longford. Uh, the story appeared in the Sunday Tribune two days after her burial. Um, it identified Anne Lovett by name and said that she had apparently concealed her pregnancy and had attended school in the local convent until the day of her death. The Sunday Tribune news editor, Brian Trench, took an anonymous call and assigned the story to Emily O'Reilly, who explains here how she established that the story was true. Apologies for the quality of the audio here. Uh, this interview was recorded in a hotel, so there's music in the background, but hopefully you'll be able to, uh, to hear it. In those days, it was pre-internet, so how did you check things out? We used to keep a stack of newspapers in, in a little room off, off the newsroom. And I looked back and there was her death was in the paper. Rang the nuns, rang the guards, and then the whole thing um, went, went from that. Um, the following week we went down and, and that was, uh, yeah, that was difficult because the, the town felt they were being scandalised and they were being blamed and very hostile. Uh, to journalists, I could understand that, and uh, so we sort of crept around the place trying to get people to talk to us, and uh, obviously didn't get that much information. 
the function of the headline has changed, as Jeffrey Kuyken and co pointed out in an article for digital journalism in 2017. If we think about the title and subtitle of this conference, the subtitle event narration and impact from past to present is the kind of thing you associate with an old newspaper headline. It gives the reader a clear understanding of what the article or the event is going to be about. Whereas the main conference title, which I know was touched on in the keynote yesterday, exciting news with capital letters and an exclamation mark is more typical of modern online headlines where the intention is to lure the reader into opening the link. Uh, I'll finish with a cautionary tale and a piece of advice that the cautionary tale dates from my own time in, in journalism when I worked primarily for the Mayo News in Westport um, and have, have very fond memories of my time there. But we did have one moment of infamy in June 2010. Um, a photograph appeared on the front page of a man being chaired shoulder high and draped in a green and red Mayo flag, which appeared directly above the headline sex offender leaves Westport. As you've probably guessed, the picture and the headline were not related. The man in the photograph is not a sex offender. He was a member of Ballon Road Musical Society, whose production of The Pirate Queen had just won the top prize at the Association of Irish Musical Awards in Killarney. So sometimes, even if the headline is right, the layout can um, make it look like a fail. And indeed, this ended up in the uh, Huffington Post. I'll finish with a piece of advice from Dick O'Reardon, who we met briefly earlier on. He entered the Irish press as a copy boy in 1961 and spent a lifetime in journalism. And Dick O'Reardon told me, if you have a good headline, a good subhead, a good caption and a good quote, you shouldn't really have to read the story. Thanks very much for listening. And I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you so much. Uh, always good to see that picture again of the sex offender leaving Westport. Uh, didn't know you had a personal involvement uh, with that story, but thank you so much. Uh, what a fantastic paper. Um, I suppose this brings us on nicely uh, to our final uh, uh, speaker in this session, uh, Professor Katrina Le uh, Leguin. Uh, she's Professor of German in the School of Languages and Culture in UCC. And her recent book was published uh, last year by Paul Grave, um, Metabiography. Uh, reflecting on biography, and she's now working on literary discourses on uh, ec uh, ecological destabilization. So I hand over to you, Katrina. Thank you. Many thanks, Eamon, and uh, thank you to everybody who's still here. It's always difficult to be the last person in the conference, but uh, really looking forward to the round table, and I've really enjoyed the, the papers over the past two days. Um, I'm going to try and start screen sharing, and I'll also be <clears throat> asking you to paste a link into your browser at some point and um, watch a short um, video. So I am not too familiar with screen sharing and Zoom. Just one second. There it is. Share. Okay. So is that now visible? Yeah, it is. Right, I'll go into slideshow. So my title, it's changed a little bit since the program was published, um, but it's Anxious Up Updates in the Anthropocene, Narrating Climate Breakdown in Recent European Fiction. And I'll just begin with a short gloss on the term Anthropocene, which I think is really becoming quite mainstream now, but just to sort of remind ourselves of, the, uh, of what it orients the discussion towards. So the term Anthropocene originating among geologists has become a useful if controversial shorthand for a bundle of interconnected features and effects of global industrial civilization, including climate crisis, global heating, ecological destruction, habitat and biodiversity loss, which are now also recognized as factors in the rise of zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19, and systematic add addiction to consumption, including the consumption of fossil fuels. In recent years, the Anthropocene has come to refer not only to these realities, but also to the political, economic and ideological regimes that uphold, exacerbate, manage and deny them. So my paper today is drawn from a, a project in which I examine some of the ways in which the Anthropocene becomes perceptible or legible in contemporary European fiction and film. In a first step, I analyse recent works that explicitly engage the Anthropocene's manifold predicaments. 
And in a second step, I contextualize these within a longer historical arc, addressing the anticipatory diagnosis of industrial civilization and its ecocidal effects in texts that long predate the term Anthropocene, which dates back around 20 years to Paul Crookson's uh, first use of it. In the context of our, um, sorry, I just realized, Oh yeah. In the context of our conference, my paper explores climate breakdown and the other multiple interlocking ecological crises of the Anthropocene as a sort of antithesis to news. In news, we consume a narrated event, supposedly for the first time, that's why it's new. Although as Jane Chapman's wonderful keynote reminded us yesterday, this narration always comes to us pre-framed. It's clothed in Robert Darnton's words, which she quoted in Attitudes, Values, Frames of Mind, recollections of the past and projections into the future. And I'm grateful to Professor Chapman for introducing this frame, which enables me to ask for my project, what attitudes, values, frames of mind, recollections of the past, and perhaps most importantly, what projections into the future clothe the narration of climate crisis. Or if climate breakdown can be viewed as the ultimate hyper object in Timothy Morton's sense, as a term already referred to yesterday in James Smith's talk, so a hyper object would be ungraspable, non-narratable, distributed unevenly across a planetary context and beyond the usual scales of human per perception. If it is a hyper object, can it ever really constitute constitute news. Might this inability to be news in fact be a serious impediment to our engagement with or our attempt to engage with ecological crisis? Whenever we read about it, it is never news because we always already know it. Rather, it becomes apprehended obliquely as the uneasy backdrop or white noise against which other smaller, more graspable news items circulate and narratives play out. So, for example, when we read an article like that of J. Rockstrom et al. published in the journal Nature in 2009, not only is it already out of date 11 years later, but even when we read it at the time, it already inspired the uncanny feelings of familiarity and belatedness that one could argue accompany all media coverage of ecological crisis and climate breakdown. So here's this the famous um, graphic from which then the donut model of donut economics is drawn so that we have the safe operating space for humanity and we have various sectors um, of the circle and in most of these the safe operating space has already been breached and that's 11 years ago. So here I'm drawing on the work of Sally Weintraub and others in the Climate Psychology Alliance who have explored the psychological structures and mechanisms of disavowal, which are not quite those of denial. So even, even the denialists are now rapidly jumping ship and, and no longer denying climate um, breakdown because its effects are visible all around us. So, but disavowal is perhaps a psychologically um, more intractable phenomenon. It involves knowing in part while refusing to acknowledge fully, holding at bay or at arm's length. And this characterizes individual responses to these phenomena as well as popular discourses on them and media coverage of them. So we can draw on two more recent sources, one from January of this year, um, Here's, here's a headline for you, previous speaker. Uh, underestimating the challenges of avoiding a ghastly future. Maybe the first time the word ghastly was ever used in the title of a, of a scientific article. Um, uh, so that was from January. Or one even more recently, uh, hot off the RTE website of last Friday, the brainstorm piece by Paul Bulger of UCC's uh, Environmental Research Institute. And we could look at these as ways of updating the reflections I've offered in um, relation to Rock's theorem of 2009 so to, to bring us into 2021. But the problem remains, unlike our avid consumption of more narratable events from vaccine trials to royal feuds to race riots, and following some of the great papers of the last two days, I now want to add earthquakes, air raids and crocodile sightings to that list. When it comes to ecological crisis, do we tend to read at one remove? And how else might we read of ecological crisis? How else might we learn to read? What kinds of texts might foster a different kind of reading of the news of ecocide, if indeed it can be called news. So these are some of the questions animating my larger project. I'll now present three instances of narration of ecological crisis in fiction. Katrin Rögler's story, Germany Radio, Deutschlandfunk, from her collection Die Alarmbereiten, The Alarmists of 2010. Philipp Weiss's Am Weltenrand sitzen die Menschen und lachen, that's at the edge of the world, people sit laughing. Neither of these texts have been translated into English yet. The one on the right is from 2017. And then the feature film, Serapili, Games People Play, of 2020, directed by Jenny Toivonieni. The first two examples 
examples, these two are of Austrian provenance and the third is Finnish. These three sources range from oblique to explicit in their engagement with ecological crisis, and they're also quite different in terms of style, genre and scale. And I think given the importance of media in all of the talks and discussions of the last two days, I'll leave you with that image for a little while in which we have, I think, eight people, seven of whom are looking at their mobile phones. Scale is a key term through which critics have sought to come closer to the aesthetic implications of the Anthropocene, not just the aesthetic, also the ethical, but approaching it via aesthetic questions. We always have to grapple with the question of scale, which is closely related to other the categories such as weirding, disjunction, disorder, and the uncanny. So these are all somehow interconnected in cultural discussions of the Anthropocene. So the problem of scale gives rise to the following reflection by eco-philosopher Timothy Morton already quoted. There you are, I'll read an abridged version of this quote, but I'll leave the whole thing on the slide. There you are turning the ignition of your car, so nice resonance with the first paper in our panel, and it creeps up on you. You are a member of a massively distributed thing. This thing is called species. Yet the difference between the weirdness of my ignition key twist and the weirdness of being a member of the human species is itself weird. Every time I start my car, I don't mean to harm her let alone cause the sixth mass extinction event. Furthermore, I'm not harming Earth. My key turning is statistically meaningless, but go up a level and something very strange happens. When I scale up these, inter these actions to include billions of key turnings and billions of coal shovelings, harm to Earth is precisely what is happening. I am responsible as a member of this species for the Anthropocene. And that's a, a, an, an often quoted passage from Morton's book, Dark Ecology. And the reason this is an often quoted passage is that it exemplifies an often remarked upon problem with the Anthropocene as a concept, namely that not all of the anthropoi, the people of the Anthropocene, are having an equal impact and not all are suffering equal effects. Not all um, have an ignition key to put uh, into uh, their car and many who do might actually prefer not to have to put it in, but don't have a choice because of the infrastructural path dependencies into which they are locked and um, quite uh, not of their own volition. So an uneasiness with the, the potentially flattening universalism of the concept Anthropocene sparks an efflorescence of neologisms and creative critical engagements far beyond the disciplinary origins of geology and atmospheric chemistry. So I won't go into these in detail, but just to give you a flavour of how the Anthropocene, um, as, as Tim Clark calls it, a threshold concept, is immensely generative of theoretical paradigms. You have some of the better known ones there. And so this is the point at which I'm going to try and introduce the link. Right now I'll stop. Um, yeah. I need to paste this link into the chat and then I'll ask you to go to your browsers and just watch it. It's a two minute uh, trailer for uh, the film games people play. And it may be depending on the browser that you have. I need to go into Zoom, hang on. Depending on how this works for you, you might be um, you might have to skip an ad. So that happened to me one of the times I looked at it. So just wait, you know, something might come up, an ad for something, just press skip ad and it'll bring you straight to the trailer. So there it is there. So I'll just give a little pause for two minutes and, and let you go and watch that. Maybe if we all mute ourselves so we don't hear the different audios at different times. And I'll see you back here in two minutes. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. So I'll, I'll go back into my slides then. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I first became aware of it at the Cork Film Festival, actually, which was online this year, but this was, was screened. So it's just from last year. It was not commercially available with English subtitles yet, I think, which should be soon. Great. Thanks, Mel. OK, so I'll try and um, go back into my screen share with the slides at this point. Um, yeah, here we are. OK. Thank you. All right, so that was the, <clears throat> give you another still from the film. So in the Nordic context, this is a familiar genre. The midsummer house party in a gorgeous rural setting provides the frame for a comedy of errors with romantic vicissitudes, partner swappings and revelations playing out under the midnight sun. Ingmar Bergman's 1955 comedy, Sommernappens Leende, Smiles of a Summer Night is a recognisable ancestor. 
Colin Nutley's 1992 Englegord, House of Angels, continues the tradition. One plot strand in Ruben Östlund's chilling 2008 study of groupthink, Don Ofri Villiga, involuntary, takes this genre to its inevitable dark side. In our current example, Games People Play, the Midsummer Night's House Party trope is spliced with the trope of attenuated class and gender anxiety in a Nordic social democracy. Mitzi, as we've seen, is working class and speaks of her escape from the ghetto. And many of the characters, all now in their mid-30s, confront disappointed hopes and dead-end jobs. The frisson of unspent post-colonial tension and cultural inferiority complex makes it felt quite comically, even heavy handedly, through the presence of the Swedish alpha male, the star of a TV series about Vikings, who sports a vest bearing the motto, this is what a feminist looks like, while putting his Finnish counterparts to shame with his woodcutting prowess. And note in this still the wry looks of the Finnish that the Finnish men exchange. And I'll leave you to discover whether it is Mikael the Swede or the flawed, likable, hard drinking Finnish rogue Herde, who makes off with the beautiful Mitzi at the end of the film. A viewing of games people play attuned to the Anthropocene context, though, is struck by the mostly unspoken low-key apocalypticism that infuses the film and runs counter to its genre. The ominous, ominous presence of a nuclear power station not far from the island hangs over the house party and is referred to at various points throughout the film. Now, in a longer version of this paper, I would have a digression here on Finland and its uneasy relationship to nuclear power. So they do have a number of nuclear power points, but it's a constant cause of minor coalition partners uh, leaving the government. And uh, there's one at the moment that's supposedly under construction with many delays, and it has the support of 26% of the population. The deferred coming of age stories that are the ostensible focus of this film are counterpointed by an apocalyptic consciousness that comes to the fore in moments of tension, conflict and resolution. In the trailer you've just seen, in one snippet of dialogue, the queasy rhetoric of revolution and the determined hedonism reciprocally undercut each other. Let's start a revolution, they say, viva la, la revolution. How do we do that? I don't know, but not like that. This. And here I've actually managed to screen grab the character in question speaking with his mouth full, as if to underscore the impossibility of articulating a vision of necessary change from within the contemporary regime of consumption. Later in the film, two sisters are reconciled by imagining themselves in old age drinking vodka together on the porch as they watch the world burn. The rom romantic comedy aspect is given an an anxious anthropocenic twist through the fact that the main couple who unite towards the end of the film will be unable to conceive a child, whereas the expectant couple seem to part company. Dialogue and setting suggest that this fraught relationship to futurity is bound up with the film's diagnosis of our civilization's unhappy predicament. Turning now to my second example, Philip Weiss's five volume debut novel, At the Edge of the World, People Sit Laughing of 2018. This represents a very different, much less lighthearted, more scaled up and head on approach to narrating the Anthropocene. Weiss's multi-perspectival epic is a self-designated Anthropocene novel. The author has, um, oh no, I've got given you a quote there. The author said that the novel is concerned with the relationship of humans to nature and technology in the Anthropocene, no less. Several of the narrative strands are set in and around the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster and its aftermath. One of the main protagonists is a climate scientist. Another washes up as a mummified corpse once alpine glaciers begin to recede. A slow journey from Europe to Japan is undertaken by the Trans-Siberian Railway. Setting, theme and plot are consciously of the Anthropocene, but the novel also probes formal and narratological challenges of writing the Anthropocene. Vice again, conventional narration can no longer adequately portray today's world. The five volumes of the novel bring us on a journey from the Paris Commune of 1871 to the aftermath of Fukushima in 2011. Their 140 years of narrated time nested within the geological and cosmic times of planetary and evolutionary history in a way that can be dizzying and frustrating for the reader. Many reviewers attest to a sense of overload and all mention the scale of the project, 1,041 pages spread over five volumes. And this is a link to another Anthropocene novel that I'm, I'm, I'm analysing together with this one, Lucy Ellman's Duck's Newburyport, whose critics all also refer to the scale and even the physical weight of the book. This almost embarrassingly banal pa parallel, the Anthropocene is a big problem, so we need to write big books about it, gives way through close textual analysis to a clearer sense of scale, relentlessness and unease 
views as hallmarks of Anthropocene aesthetics. As the Australian philosopher Clive Hamilton recently put it of the Anthropocene, the essential disposition appears to be that of dread. Now, while Weiss's novel, actually, I'll leave you with that slide because it's got such a, a nice image on it, which I can talk about more in the discussion. Um, while Weiss's novel has gar garnered a number of prestigious prizes, there's been little sustained critical engagement to date with its main uh, thematic and conceptual driver, which is the potentially catastrophic turn in human and planetary history, the discovery by humans of fossil fuels as an energy source, those oil pots to which um, uh, our first speaker this afternoon referred. Or as some critics prefer to put it, some eco-critics prefer to, to, to invert that uh, formulation and say that this is the moment when oil discovers humans. All five volumes of Vice's novel are preoccupied with the literal and figurative fallout of the fossil fuel and nuclear ages and with the energy regimes that have brought human civilization to a peak of extraordinary complexity and global reticulation, but also and concomitantly to the brink of collapse. Chantal, Chantal Blanchard, who is a narrator of one of the volumes, has five different volumes with five different narrators, and she's a climate scientist, um, and she writes a didactic pamphlet entitled Destroy Yourselves, in which she refers to pyromaniac man. We, the implicated subjects, that's a term I'm borrowing from uh, Michael Rothberg, the implicated subjects of the industrial growth society shift in Chantal's analysis from being Promethean, taming and unle unleashing the vast energy reserves stored in the earth, to being pyromaniac, setting fire to and consuming the very life support systems on which the existence of future generations depends. Borrowing Timothy Clark's terms, we could say that Vice's protagonist suffers from Anthropocene disorder, the symptoms of which can range from extreme misanthropy to physical sickness, nausea, feeling physically sick, for example, when we see an open cast mine is, is one example that Timothy Clark uses. So Chantal's response to the Anthropocene predicament is quite different to that of the Finnish hedonists in Toy Niemi's film. Rather than keeping on partying, Chantal elects to disappear or dematerialize through a process of self-starvation, which is accompanied by obsessive depilation. And her final pages look like this. Um, you can see the way the, the, the typeface has gone right down and there's a, just an awful lot of white space on the page. And then it says, ich schrumpfe auf einen Massepunkt, which I had thought in my ignorance of theoretical physics meant I shrink to a mass, a point of matter. But actually, I think it means I shrink to a point mass if there's anybody in the audience with knowledge of the difference between mass point and point mass i'd be very grateful for elucidation it's it's kind of a it's on my to-do list so there's a lot, lot more to say about vice's text but rather than discussing the other four volumes of the novel i'd like to conclude rather with a brief commentary on a much shorter prose text by katrin rögle and this is the piece Germany Radio Deutschland Funk, the last in the collection the alarmists the alarm of 2010 this text consists of a montage of voices phoning into a radio show in the aftermath of an unspecified catastrophe, which may or may not have been a flood. Sandbags are mentioned at one point. It's a vox pop of post-disaster consciousness in a context in which, to quote one of the voices, quote, the all clear has not been given because a full all clear cannot be given. That is the situation with which one must live. And I found that reading that now uh, during the pandemic was a very resonant. This text conveys a Kafkaesque sense of impenetrable complexity and absconded authority, as well as a media critical insight into the disappointed voyeurism of survivors who feel cheated of spectacle and event. The quickly moving landscape of catastrophe is portrayed indirectly. It's always just out of sight or always just past, but it's, un it's unpredictable unfolding aftermath is palpable through the breakdown of telecommunications and the gridlocked highways with which the story ends. The final section of the story, which I've given to you here on the slide, is a particular kind of news bulletin characterized by a never changing format, and that's the traffic report. And actually, just to give you a flavor of it, I'll read a little bit of this traffic report because we, we all know what traffic reports sound like and they are very samey they're kind of news without being news so i think it's nice to hear this in the original here we have it a1 köln zwischen kreuz köln nord und köln löwnig unfall vier kilometer stau a1 köln richtung dortmund zwischen gevelsberg und westhofener kreuz zwei kilometer stau nach einem unfall in der baustelle dort steht ein defekter lkw auf der fahrbahn I'll skip a bit. A2 Dortmund Richtung Oberhausen zwischen Kreuz Recklingenhausen und Raststätte Ressermark Baustelle 3 Kilometer Stau. Dort sind nur zwei Fahrstreifen frei. 
Äh, drei in Nürnberg Richtung Passau, zwischen Kreuz Regensburg und regensburg burg -Weinting. Unfall, fünf Kilometer stockender Verkehr. Vorsicht auf der A7 Hannover Richtung Kassel. Zwischen Derneburg, Salzgitter und Dreieck Salzgitter befinden sich Personen auf der Fahrbahn. Und an these four words, Personen auf der Fahrbahn, people on the road, um, it's kind of slightly more impersonal, actually, it's not Menschen auf der Fahrbahn, it's Personen auf der Fahrbahn, so there are people walking on the road. Again, it's, it reads now as a very prescient um, anticipation of the uh, unforgettable scenes of 2016, when we actually had Personen auf der Fahrbahn, the arrival of the Syrian refugees walking along the highways uh, uh, through Central Europe and up into Germany. Um, but that's just by the by. Uh, Rögle, who is a, not only a prize winning author of fiction, but also now she's professor for literary writing at the Academy of of Media Arts in Cologne, has written in connection with another one of her projects there. This was the quote I wanted to, to, to read to finish off. Um, some want strong images, big emotions, clear narration, mood. Others want complex information, didactics, reflection, talking heads. And I am in the middle of all this and want something different altogether. In Rögler's Deutschlandfunk, the news of climate catastrophe <clears throat> informs a generalized atmosphere of uneasy excitability that inhibits any coherent response. The competing scales of ecological disturbance, national media landscape and individual experience resist any clear conjunction, dissolving instead into a paralyzing and at times comical incommensurability. So it is quite a funny text as well. But in its most disturbing section, we read uh, what appears to be the voice of someone who has died in the catastrophe, who's speaking from the afterlife about how quickly she is being forgotten. Life goes on and the rituals of mourning and memorialization are to be got through quickly in order to make space for more important things, the health and enjoyment of life by those who have survived. In conclusion, by reading Rögla's short story alongside Toivaniemi's film and Weiss's five-volume novel, I've tried to suggest some of the possibilities and limits of fiction, whether literary prose or feature film, short form or long form, as an elaboration of Anthropocene consciousness. Reading these and other fictions with an eye to the ways in which they enact and foster apprehension of ecological crisis in the Anthropocene, we might gain a clearer sense of the shifts in consciousness this new epoch demands of us and enforces upon us, shifts in consciousness that might enable us finally to register the news of ecocide. Thank you for your attention. I'll stop sharing now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Katrina. Thank you for a fascinating paper. Um, as per usual, now I'll open up the floor to questions. Um, I have the chat open and, and the, the screen's open as well. So maybe if you want to uh, raise your hand at the chat uh, or on your screen or put into the chat that you have a question. Um, while we're waiting, I suppose, for, for questions uh, to, uh, to, 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 to appear in the chat or on screen, I suppose that I would just like to abuse the privilege of chair and maybe just ask uh, each of the speakers a, a quick question. Um, Liang, if I could uh, start with you, I just wondered, um, you know, thinking a little bit more about the car as a symbol, particularly in, in contemporary newspapers, I was struck, I think I remember the Leprechaun, um, which was a, 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 a monthly cartoon that was published very anti, I was very, uh, Thomas Fitzpatrick was extremely anti-car, anti-modernity, anti-progress really, I suppose uh, he fit right in, in among certain sections of society that I won't comment on, um, but I, I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit more uh, uh, in a second, you know, thinking a little bit more about the car as a symbol of modernity. Um, and then Daniel, I suppose my question for you is thinking a little bit more about the practicalities of print, which of course I, I hadn't really appreciated when it comes to newspapers. And I wonder, you know, you mentioned, you know, the ideas of, you know, there was too few uh, e-letters uh, at one point, you know, so they couldn't run certain headings. Are there any other kind of limitations uh, caused by technology as well that we have to elaborate on a little bit more as well? And then I suppose my final question then uh, for you, Katrina, just think a little bit more. I thought it was fascinating insights using fiction as a window into our consciousness of, of, of I suppose, eco ecological disasters. Uh, I, and I wonder, you know, could you unpack a little bit more what you said at the start of your paper, you know, thinking about Darnton, thinking about the frames which we draw on to, 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 to make narratives. Maybe if you could just talk a little bit more about that, uh, that would be great. Um, thank you all very much. Okay, um, I'll, I'll start first. Um, 
you're completely right. Um, cars are considered to be a symbol of modernity throughout from the very beginning, the whole way through. Um, one of the chief things you see is in Ireland as, and I, I say this as a northerner, so what would you expect? Um, nor Ireland manages to politicise the car. The minute they turn up in 1896, they politicise it. You have Irish nationalists very anti the car from a very early perspective, because what they're saying is, what's going to happen the blacksmith? What's going to happen to that that horse trade that's been there? That's a symbol of Ireland. You know, we're known for our horses. What what are we doing with this? And that continues quite a lot throughout, um, right up until uh, up until the First World War, which is ironic because obviously the Easter Rising. Um, I've done a lot of research into that. Easter Rising really is purpose of how it comes about is mainly cars and um, between gun runnings between mm. transporting people to and from um, uh, conversations and meetings across Ireland and um, one of the big proponents the whole way through until the 1930s is uh, or sorry opponents sorry of cars the whole way through is Eamon de Valera who ironically enough in the 1910s there is a few newspaper clippings you find he was involved in a court case because he actually ran over he into a housemaid um, in his own car. So you kind of go, oh, there's there's a little bit of an irony going on here. Um, but the whole way through, what you see post-World War One, I, I would say, is there is an acceptance in the same way that uh, there's an acceptance in the army that motorised warfare is the way forward. You have that with the car. Post, mm. In 1914, there's still a debate around, are cars the future, are they not? What you have by 1918 is everybody has accepted that the car is the way forward. And what you have is particularly Irish men who have been at the front. Some of them had had the opportunity to have learned to drive there. Others have seen these vehicles in motion and they return very keen to, to kind of develop that. And, and this um, industry then builds up really into the 1920s and kind of goes forward. What I mentioned very briefly, just to kind of wrap it up, because I know it's much more interested in hearing everybody else's um, answers, uh, the completely knocked down uh, trade, which develops a post-economic war in, in the 1930s. That's an interesting one that's unique to Ireland. And when you see that industry come up, so what that essentially is, is think a motorised version of IKEA. Um, in that mm. they can't import cars because that's going to, the tax is too high. Nobody's going to be able to afford a car. What they do is cars are assembled and then deassembled basically, uh, put into boxes, transported into these factories, particularly they're built up, particularly around like looking and places like that around Dublin and um, a few in Cork. And once they kind of come in, they're assembled in Ireland. So they're sold as Irish assembled cars as opposed to Irish manufactured cars. And that's where you see the break then in what the, that final opposition that's held out in terms of modernity and, and the idea of cars being modernity. They kind of go away from that because they realize there's a financial, there's financial gain to this. This is going to help the country. So they actually kind of get behind it. Yeah, well, no, thank you so much. I, I really thought it was fascinating some of the headlines that you described as well. The idea, you know, driver doesn't remember. I mean, that news story would be represented in very different ways today, which is why I was really struck thinking about Daniel's paper, because if we think of Norman Fairclough's language and power, power is expressed through headlines. And Daniel has completely complicated that picture by thinking, by talking and discussing the, the practicalities of, of making these headlines. So, Daniel, can I hand over to you, please? Yeah, it just it, it it just struck me. I mean, your your question allows me to touch maybe on two things that were actually originally part of my presentation, but I, I ended up leaving them out for for reasons of time. One was um, I, I, one of my interviewees, Gerald Flynn, had done some sub editing at the Star after it it appeared in the Irish market. It was originally a a, a, a half and half um, operation between independent newspapers and the Express. And so a lot of their content, particularly in the early days, were was um, was British um, and material came over from Manchester. And one of Gerald Flynn's jobs, and when, when you talk about technological limitations, one of his jobs was to use a scalpel to physically cut out material that was deemed unsuitable for an Irish audience. So the example that he gave, and it, it what Leanne said about Irish assembled cars, it it it. it Kind of a newspaper equivalent he said if, if 
if he came across a story that mentioned our beloved Queen Mum, it was his job to physically cut this out with a scalpel and then replace it with, they had a variety of different size ads for the St. Vincent de Paul, which for, for <laughs> any of the non-Irish is a, is a homeless charity. And so his job was to insert a random St. Vincent de Paul ad to replace this, this item about our, our beloved Queen Mum. The, um, the other one, just in relation to limitations, and it was, it was something that Pat Brennan touched on when we talked about the, the difficulties imposed by an early deadline in the Sunday Tribune. And she said, like, that one, one, um, the one way of, of, of um, offering some kind of a solution was if there was a predictable event that was scheduled for a Saturday. And the example she gave was that when Ireland lost to Italy in the 1990 World Cup in Rome, um, that game was played on a Saturday. It was the it was Ireland's first ever football World Cup. It was the main talking point for the country, and so there was no question of putting anything else on the front page. But by the time that game was over, it was going to be too late for a for a page. And so what they did was they took an image from an earlier game, Packy Bonner making his famous save and the penalty shootout against Romania, and they ran that with the headline "They've done us proud," which, based on the fact that Ireland had kind of been seen to overachieve was going to work regardless of whether Ireland beat Italy or lost no. um, and Ireland did lose that but it it they, they it was um it was it was kind of one one solution but obviously for for breaking news with no element of predictability like the Evelyn Glenn Holmes um mm -hmm. story there was there was no way around that yeah oh well thank you very much Daniel thank you uh, Katrina I'll hand over to you yeah, thanks very much for, for both questions. I see there's one in the chat as well from Andrea Di Carlo. So thanks for that. I'll try and answer them together. Um, yes, coming back to, to what we heard um, from Jane Chapman and uh, obviously quoting also Robert Darnton and, and the question of how news is enframed. So uh, the the idea of collective consciousness loomed large in, large in our discussions, particularly yesterday. And it's a, it's an idea with which, uh, you know, I, I find it immensely productive to think about collective consciousness, but I'm also deeply uneasy with it because which collective is being posited and what are the mechanisms of inc inclusion and exclusion and identification and silencing? What are the epistemic violences that might constitute the, the, the collective of that collective consciousness? And this, of course, is, is the issue with which we grapple as soon as we talk about the Anthropocene and as soon as we try to locate an I or a we in that Anthropos of the Anthropocene, because it is um, distributed unevenly on a planetary scale. Okay, so that would be maybe the, the, the first thing to, to say. This absolutely connects to the question of, of inframing and collective consciousness, but mm -hmm. it troubles it. And um, coming then to the question in the chat, uh, Andrea, many thanks for that. So. There's, there's a radical answer to this question, which is that there is no outside the environmental context. So we are breathing air, we are drinking water and our planet is heating. And so there is not a context that would be outside the environmental context. And actually what you'll find with eco-philosophers and, and kind of eco-critical discourse is that the term environment itself is one that is not used so much in those conversations because it posits a subject object divide an environment which we kind of in inhabit that is somehow nevertheless separate to us and on which we have impact through our behaviors and so if we change our behaviors we may manage to change those impacts but it's that very cartesian framing of a subject and object a, su a subject of human history versus a, pa a passive nature on which we uh, write our story that's being troubled by the anthropocene context in which um, natural forces and anthropogenic climate change are themselves gaining historical agency. So nature is no longer the ahistorical scene on which human history is written. It rather is also agential. So I think that would be almost the, the, the answer there. But I suppose the, the, um, the examples that Timothy Morton uses are very eloquent. So um, I mentioned climate change, which he actually calls global heating because he said the climate, climate change is itself a euphemism. Um, and it's very interesting to see those of you who are journalists, you know, the choices that have been made by some of the major broadsheets in recent years to move away from climate change and to use instead terms like climate crisis and, and climate breakdown. And um, so I you know the Guardian ran a few pieces about that a couple of years ago, and they now no longer use the term climate change. Uh, climate change. Uh, the other examples uh, Morton uses are polystyrene and plutonium. So when he said, think about polystyrene, 
not just a piece of polystyrene or a polystyrene cup, but all the polystyrene that has ever been made. And as well as being um, ungraspable, non-narratable and unevenly distributed on a planetary, uh, planet-wide, it's also beyond the scales of human perception because it outlasts me. And he also talks about plutonium and half-lives uh, in the nuclear context that you know we're trying to make. And again, coming back to Finland and its nuclear um, kind of dilemma, you know, that, that there's a wonderful documentary about uh, the nuclear waste in Finland, which has been buried. And then there are there's the problem of how can you make a sign that will be legible to humans who may or may not come across that waste in 100,000 years time to make it clear to them that it is dangerous to go anywhere near this sarcophagus because no human civilization has ever lasted for that length of time. So how can you communicate across that span of time it's ungraspable it sort of exceeds our frame of perception so again this comes back to the question of inframing and collective consciousness mm -hmm. which I'm, I'm so grateful to this conference for having kind of foregrounded that issue because it's one i've really been grappling with in, in my own work Thanks. thank you very much i i see there's thank a you. question for daniel in the chat there from sarah daniel would you mind uh, addressing that please yeah thanks very much for the for the question yeah i i i'd say it's probably all of the above you know the, the 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 internet has has played a role but also this, this as you say this loss of material constraints um the the point that dick o'reardon was making it, it and the, the reason that you kept seeing things like man dies in crash repeated over and over again was particularly for these single column stories mm. where you you know you're literally trying to work out okay i can i can get four words of less than six letters into um into each of these into each of these spaces and of course what, what was technically technologically possible in in terms of newspaper design of course is 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 so much different as well so much of this work was done manually with with like the the reason we use the word cut and paste is because it literally was cut and then had had some kind of adhesive applied before you'd um you'd you'd put it down i'm 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 struggling to think of a of another example off the top of my head but if, if anything occurs to me in the in the next few minutes i'll um I'll, I'll i'll send it on to you as well thanks very much for the question thank, thank you very for much for the Anne. reply thank you uh, are there any further questions for our speakers i would have a question for daniel if i may Sure. It was not really a question, it's just a comment, your, your, your presentation, which I really enjoyed, it put me in mind of, um, you've probably come across it, that uh, it was a, a, a podcast with Maeve Binch, I think a while back, in which she told a very funny anecdote about having to change with the boiled egg and Theodore Fitzgibbon, yeah, <laughs> because it was again, and so I wanted really to ask about the role of images in, in your work as well, because obviously the constraints on the headline, the physical constraints on the headline, then are complicated by the introduction of images. And I think in that anecdote of Maeve Binch, it was all around having found an image that then turned out to be the image of human heart, and so couldn't be used in the cookery pages and had to be substituted at the last minute and, and she had to kind of get a lift into into Delir Street in the middle of the night to sort this out and is that kind of physicality um, of images that of course is, is is so historical to us now does that come up in in some of the the interviews it does yeah thanks very much for the question Katrina um yeah any, anyone who hasn't seen or who hasn't heard that piece of audio there, there's there's an audio only version of it available on youtube which i I'd, I'd highly recommend i i shared it with my undergraduate students last year um it's about five five or six minutes and yeah to explaining the the whole process of how something that was meant to be a, a was was being used as an illustration of a casserole turned out to be the implements used in the first heart transplant in south africa um so i i should explain that my my general uh, the, the, sub, the focus of my thesis is, is on journalism and politics, journalism and religion, journalism and technology, and journalism as a career choice. So headlines per se doesn't come up except where it's it's kind of pertains to to any of those subjects. But I mean, one, one of the interviews I've done um, was with Lee Mulcahy, the former uh, um, independent uh, newspapers photographer, and he he tells that that he, he his career spans that entire period and he, he he talks very interestingly about how um you know when when he started it was essentially impossible to be a, a, 
a photographer incognito. You know, everybody carried these enormous um, pieces of technology, which it was sort of impossible to hide. He, he talks about one, one story that he covered about a, a student protest, which I think might have been in Maynooth. And he, he said he, he managed to get access where others didn't simply because he had an early handheld camera that he was able to hide in his coat pocket. Um, and so he, he, he also talks about the, the later stages where he and, a, and a, the um, Evening Herald editor went to England to, um, to get the early digital cameras and they, they got one digital camera and within, you know, a month there were four and within a year every person in the um in the organization had a had a camera so um it's um he, he his career and his story kind of spans that that entire period and as you've kind of seen in the talk there's a there's a version of that for 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 the written journalists as well although it's 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 maybe a more complicated story to to tell i hope that i hope that answers your question thank you Thank you very much. We have time, I think, for uh, one final question there, if anyone would like to, to ask a question of any of our speakers. Um, okay, I think that, uh, uh, that, that'll that bring uh, 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 proceedings for this panel to a close. I, I would like to thank the three speakers for their fascinating presentations. Well done. I really learned a lot. I enjoyed a lot. I have a lot to think about now. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Um, a virtual clap from everyone. I was about to say a virtual hug. That's the world that we're living in, I suppose. Uh, a virtual clap from everyone. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll hand it over to Professor Julie. Thank you, everyone. Well, once again, um, thanks to all of you. And um, thanks to uh, our um, all of um, the other participants uh, and our audience. Um, and also for your your patience and forbearance, but fair forbearance uh, in terms of it has been a um, a very packed two days. Um, there's been a lot of um, a, a lot of um, information and a lot of of um, um, a, a lot of of. Um, uh, a, a very rapid rhythm of movement from one talk to another and a vast number of themes. And in a way, um, well, after these two days, I think almost any summon summary would be slightly misleading. Um, nevertheless, uh, <laughs> we're going to try and we have organized a um, a small uh, roundtable discussion uh, that will be um, uh, populated basically by our Euro News team, and well, I think one or two others uh, outside of that. So I can introduce you to um, Sarah Mansuti, who's been working in the background on uh, admitting people to the conference uh, uh, over these days. Um, then there is uh, Volker Kreuze, uh, who has been uh, tweeting um, diligently uh, across this time. Um, Davide Boerio, whom you heard, uh, and, um, a, and uh, Lorenzo Allori, who has also been managing the technology and tweeting up a storm, and Andrea Di Carlo, uh, who you've also uh, met as uh, a, uh, a panel chair. So um, I think we're not going to attempt any kind of, let's say, um, conclusion, except simply to leave you with some thoughts, um, a few uh, thoughts regarding some of what might be the wider implications of our deliberations over these two days um, uh, since um, the um, uh, the obviously the implications of what we've been doing are quite colossal if we think about it um, we obviously can't live without news it's um, hasn't been done in a very long time 
Uh, in fact, not only would that be very boring, but uh, also ignorance is not an option. Uh, we need the benefits that news may bring with all the possible conditions and modifications to that. Um, benefits such as emancipation, agency, and so forth, uh, and as well as entertainment. And the same has been true since the first news. And I'm not sure when that would be. Was it the message brought by Eve to Adam on that um, fateful day at the beginning of whatever? Um, but there, uh, apart from uh, what might be the mythic uh, uh, or biblical um, origins of, of news, certainly the Renaissance is the beginning of the first news genres, and we've seen some um, discussion of that. So certainly there has been a more or less continuous development from that period, and we've seen the amazing number of genres that news has, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, been found in or utilized or, or been based on from novels to films to um, illustrations to cartoons to texts of every sort to music as well. We've seen songs and newspapers, newsletters, social media, and so on, each of this with its own history and its own significance and its own way of dealing with the um, with the material, and we've met some of the uh, um, uh, causal and agency aspects of media technology. For instance, in uh, Daniel Carey's um, talk a few minutes ago, where we find the technology of the headlines may affect the headlines. Uh, and this is also true of any of the other technologies that um, we haven't talked so much about that have affected so much the look of news and also the message um, of the news, uh, the particular format that genres may take necess uh, um, uh, necessarily affects the message. So, I mean, the, the McLuhan is trite phrase of um, the medium is the message. Well, uh, Yes and no. Um, I, I, I tend to like the original version that appeared as the title um, that was actually um, um, a, mis a, a, a typo typographical error so that the original book was called um, The Medium is the Massage. And uh, apparently McLuhan liked that so much that he, he left that as the title, at least on the first edition. But maybe that is more, um, uh, I think, uh, accurate in regard to what we've discovered in regard to the media. But obviously the content is also important. So it's not just the medium itself, it's also the content. And we've seen some um, concentrated studies of, of content based on particular micro histories in, re in regard to disasters, to earthquakes and so forth, and stories of, of uh, pain. Also in this last paper, stories about um, uh, uh, headlines, uh, car crashes and uh, aspects such as this, um, where the content of, of news is itself uh, um, a key aspect of uh, the effect of news. So it's more than just the medium. Uh, it's also what's in the medium. We've discussed the major features, you might say, of media history, which are production, reception, and impact, or as Giovanni Florio um, modified this to um, production, reception, and re-elaboration, maybe that makes more sense. On the reception and impact side, We've talked about um, mirrors or makers. Um, so what exactly do the media do? Um, do they respond or are they responded to? And I think we've seen in many cases, both are true. Um, other aspects of reception and impact, we've discussed uh, Benedict Anderson and other theories, uh, the role of crowds, the effects of humor on, um, uh, in fact, the uh, role of cartoons in Chris Williams' um, talk and in, uh, um, some others. Theoretical insights 
impact on that aspect of uh, reception and impact. We've mentioned here and there, we've heard the names Habermas, Edgar Moran, that was my contribution in a, in a comment. And De uh, Katrina uh, brought in uh, Descartes a couple minutes ago. Um, Michael Shudson has come up. All of these are theoretical in in insights uh, regarding the reception and impact that are important for framing the story that we want to tell. Because of course, what we are doing is we are also creating a narrative, a narrative about the effects of journalism, about what journalism does, about what the media do. Uh, media effects may involve society, uh, change in regard to politics, economics, ecology, as in um, uh, ecology, as in Katrina's talk, uh, and uh, affecting, affecting also um, a, a whole literature that's actually based on the media of news, um, you might call at least a part of that, the Norman Mailer tradition, where articles in the newspaper become the basis for writing about, uh, um, writing uh, uh, novelistic um, renditions that uh, give background where background was slim. Uh, we've also spoken about um, propaganda theory uh, although we haven't gone into much detail, Eamon Darcy's paper and propaganda theory, of course, which is largely a product of early 20th century uh, thinking about um, the development, the emergence of mass media based on the uh, development of technologies that made mass media po possible in the latter half of the 19th century. By the early 20th century, we had Leonard Du. Uh, later, we had um, Laswell and uh, numerous uh, others, propaganda theories that are still in one way or the other uh, still applicable, but are also based on close analyses of texts in regard to topics, in regard to adjec adjectives being used. Uh, uh, so for instance, in uh, Leanne Blaney's um, talk about uh, car crashes, um, uh, we might be wondering exactly how were emotions, um, let's say, brought into play by particular formations of words, by particular kinds of phrases and so on. So there's a, a, um, a, a deep content analysis uh, um, issue that um, is, uh, can be part of our our methodological uh, toolkit. On the production side, uh, we have um, issues regarding how does um, uh, how does the production work? What is the technology that we're using for um, um, uh, for producing this these media? Uh, and once we have uh, enough of a collection of media to uh, work our analyses on, uh, how are we going to go about that? And um, this is where some of the more advanced techniques of machine analysis and, uh, and topic uh, modeling and things like that, uh, such as some of us are attempting to use in regard to very large quantities of, of, um, of digital data for um, uh, in creating hypotheses regarding uh, um, what was in the news and what the news was ab about over long periods of time and making um, a, a network uh, studies uh, based on uh, places mentioned and connections between individuals and uh, various uh, um, uh, circles that they were involved in. Then there's the aspect of the dynamic development over time. Uh, many of the studies that we've seen today are rooted in a particular time and place, um, sometimes uh, a 10 year period, sometimes uh, less. If we look at the larger developments such as um, uh, where does uh, media history fit in regard to uh, the history of the press in general. So some um, hold to a technocentric view. So what 
causes change in media is um, mostly the change in media technology. Others have looked at a more culture centric view. So the um, change in media occurs because of changes in the way people live, changes in the way people um, communicate from day to day. Then there's the question of, uh, are the media getting better? Uh, and are people getting more intelligent? So that would be the sort of positive, positivist view and its um, it, it critics. So um, are social media an improvement or are social media a simply a, um, um, a, a passing uh, fashion? Then we have the geist of journalism. So um, what indeed do journalists do and why do they do it? And um, what is the particular role that we want for journalism if it were possible for us to um, decide on that? A positive uh, force or is it a, um, um, without any, uh, let's say, um, a particular quality that inheres to it so that it can be either positive or negative depending on what's in it. There's much more to say, um, but um, I'd like to uh, um, hand the um, uh, microphone over to some of the members of our, um, uh, our round table to comment now that they've had a chance to think about um, what they might be contributing and who would like to go first. Uh, unfortunately, the table is not round. Uh, it's kind of, of um, all over the place here. Um, so just make a sign. There you go. Is, was I that would like to go first. Oh, OK, was... thank you, Voter. Yeah, because uh, I don't know, like your question struck me of uh, are media getting better, is the quality getting better, which of course at the end will be an impossible question to answer, but it's still very thought-provoking. You know? I think it also depends a lot on on uh, what is the goal of the of, the, of a certain media, and I think that we have seen over this past two days that actually there have been many different goals, uh, like because media can be used to impose maybe a certain opinion, maybe to distribute a certain opinion, but it can also be used to actually acquire information. Uh, in that sense, they're very, very different. Or it just depends if it's a mass media, as we've seen today. Uh, we've also seen that the, the context of the media changes today, like as you said, like uh, even about the music, but if, it, if it's in a different context, then it means something else. Uh, we've maybe also seen that things can be misunderstood, like for example, with the headline and the photograph, they're unluckily together. Uh, I think also in our work, we see that many of the uh, news uh, we study are being reworked uh, in different forms. Uh, we've also, I think, seen this and many other examples of this two days. For example, in the presentation also, uh, Rosanna Bars, we've seen uh, about the uh, reception of the news. Um, uh, and, uh, as you also talked earlier already about the reception um, and, and the, the, the rework of news. And, like, I guess this is what media in general very often do, is they take information, which also what journalists do nowadays, take other sources uh, and rework them, which is a very central, I think, to be a VZ that we use uh, in Europe. Okay, very good, Walter. Um, uh, I think that's true, and um, indeed, one of the, uh, the, the central source that the Euro News Project is working on is this, we might call it almost uh, the, um, uh, the most primitive kind of, of um, transmission, which is the manuscript. But, well, um, primit the most primitive, I suppose, would be the oral transmission. Ours is step two. So I can am I follow. seeing Sarah, Sarah's hand up? Okay. Yes. Yeah. What I like about this uh, um, conference is the multidisciplinary approach, because now in this pandemic time, uh, there are a lot of uh, occasion or online conferences, uh, workshops, seminars, but I tend, I think as other scholars, to focus on my research, my topic, uh, while this conference is 
gave me the chance to broaden my horizons and my, also my research and see the media history as a big picture. I like the, um, I would like to quote uh, Domenico Cecere. Yesterday he said, every channel of communication is inserted in a wider context of media. And even if we study, we study a handwritten newsletter, we need to be aware that there are other, uh, others, uh, media like uh, newspaper, diaries, letters, uh, chronicles, and later also cartoons, drawing, graffiti, and movies. So I like the idea of the continuity of this media phenomenon that probably is based on the human nature because uh, we desire to know and we desire to inform and be informed about the things. And what is clear from this conference is that uh, when we read uh, and study news, uh, we don't need only to focus on the content uh, because also who wrote it, why, when, uh, and for who, it's important for, for which public is important. And also it's more important how news uh, is received and, per, and the event then perceived by the public. And in addition, uh, other elements that can influence this content and that, can, uh, and that was uh, clear from our talks uh, is, uh, from one side, the control and the propaganda, and from the other side, uh, on the other side, the, the material aspects, like Daniel um, underlined how the, the headlines can be, um, can depend also on uh, limited space uh, on, or limited number of characters. And this is uh, a problem of manual printing uh, since the uh, 16 or middle of the 15th century. What probably needs more um, research is the oral transmission of news uh, that uh, in this uh, conference has not been, we, have, we haven't had the chance to talk uh, about uh, it and probably is a aspect uh, that uh, needs to be more uh, research. And so to, to conclude, uh, I like this idea of the complexity of media history and that uh, when we analyze a news object, uh, we, um, we need to be aware that there are multiple levels of analysis and that this object that could be a handwritten newsletter, a newspaper or a chronicle is embedded in a media history that precedes and follows it. And I'd like to conclude with the, um, uh, Professor Chapman's um, sentence that uh, she said yesterday, media history is problematic, but it is what makes it so exciting. Very good, thank you for that insight. It is indeed problematic as we've seen. Yes, well, I suppose that's my turn. So I just want to say, uh, first of all, that uh, you started off that news as music of what happened. And I can say that this has been a wonderful festival. So I'd like to thank <laughs> all the panelists, all the organizer, Mael Farrell and the Irish Human Alliance. We uh, for the uh, for these splendid uh, conference with so many insights from so many um, perspectives and disciplines and a, a full range of periods and you know uh, different takes has been a very um, for me very um, useful conference interesting conference because it has allowed me to elaborate a bit more on some things that I, I, at the beginning, I could have expected. In a way, this kind of, as a, as a early modern historian, this is a way of continuity, in a sense, of media. Maybe we should use the Latin words. I don't know, because 
you know, in the early modern period, the mass media was not really there, but was something, was uh, maybe uh, as uh, uh, Shudson said uh, in an article he wrote, uh, we could define news as the sense-making practice of modernity, a dominant force in the public construction of com common experience, and the popular sense of what is real and important. But we also have the, uh, dealt with different topics. For example, um, I was thinking how for an early modern historian it would be great to have some sources that maybe the 18th century historian has, or also, you know, like contemporary historians, like, you know, how it would be great to interview some of other you know, friends, which unfortunately they cannot speak. So we have also struggled to find uh, new methodological uh, insights and try to ask many questions to our sources. And uh, also the idea at some point, uh, so it was fascinating the idea of the, how people responded in Gaelic to the news. So I, in the first panel. Then also the idea of, um, of authorship and anonymity in a way. So if we live in the same world, in a way we share the same news. So, uh, and all the, 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 the sharing of this news. So who is really the author? So uh, this arises question on the copyright, for example, so important even for nowadays uh, issues like, you know, as you know, the vaccine, for example, but that's another story. And also uh, the, the, the rule of cities, the rule of space, the rule of regions like the Irish Sea, and also, you know, um, well, a lot of things. I have 10 uh, actually uh, pages of those. I'm not going to uh, tell you everything, but I'm happy that this conference will be recorded because it will give me give me the the, the the chance to go back and see and uh, take more insights. And also, Brodel, we have talked about Brodel at some point, the center periphery aspect, no, and how some somehow some events can rearticulate that system of center periphery. We have talked about also of some peripheral regions, like maybe, you know, Naples in a way, uh, Ireland in another. Then we have also touched upon the, 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 the aspect of control. So uh, the public sphere, for example, in East Germ in Germany. So a very fruitful and uh, great conference. And for this, thank you very much to everybody. Okay, thanks very much. And um, add a couple words there, um, Andrea. Uh, now, to be honest, I have I don't again as I've just written in the chat. I I don't want to overemphasize it, but this conference for me has been a real boon. I've learned a lot. I've expanded. It's actually been a gift, if I can say so, to my. Um, to uh, understanding the early modern age from other perspectives, uh, both from uh, um, news perspective, but at the same time from uh, other genres of other, uh, uh, sorry, other genres of history, like uh, um, uh, micro history. I especially like the. Um, the the paper by Lorenza, yes, the one about um, was it? the uh, the viceroy in Naples that was extremely interesting from a macro historical point of view, and at the same time, <laughs> so many things actually I believed were completely disconnected from uh, media these days are actually very useful and very productive, like headlines, for example. And also, um, even the Anthropocene and the way the Anthropocene can be, you could also be used in describing uh, earthquakes or uh, any kind of dis destructive events in the early modern age. 
Excellent. I think, I think um, the Anthropocene can be used to say, to explain the, um, can be, uh, to explain the, um, the, uh, the, the, the earthquakes that who we're talking about this, um, at this morning. So I think that something so contemporary can also be used to illuminate it, something much older than mm -hmm. our days. Excellent points. And um, would anybody else like to join our roundtable? Um, say a couple words before I, the um, conclusion of the conclusion. I just like to add uh, things that I forgot. Uh, for mm -hmm. me, what is really important, I mean, me, why we are talking about media? Because actually our life since last 20 years or so, even more, is completely, you know, uh, we are into media. And also there is a lot of historiography, especially the German one that maybe we should also consider like terms like mediatization, stuff like that, really important. But what I really like to stress is why I'm interested in this is because I'm interested in the human experience. And I think that we could understand we should understand historically that human experience, just this. Thank you very much for that. And any other uh, insights, inputs? Um, Mel? Thank you, Brendan. Um, I just want to say um, from an Irish Humanities Alliance perspective, you know, we were delighted to support this conference uh, when the proposal came in. Um, you know, it stood out as a, an excellent uh, proposal and uh, a very, uh, it was pre-COVID, I would say. It was um, uh, about 18 months ago, I believe, uh, the proposal came in um, when we put out a call for the, for the annual conference. And um, at that point, um, you know, I suppose Brexit was one of the big uh, topics uh, in the, the, the news, so to speak. Um, and then when the when the conference kind of got the go ahead, uh, COVID kind of hit and we we sort of delayed a little bit because we weren't sure if we, we were hoping we could, you know, have the event in in, in UCC. Um, but in the end, we, we had to go online, which was a wise decision. But uh, just to say, uh, from an IHA perspective, it's the fifth annual um, Irish Humanities Conference. And I think, you know, some of the um, connections that are made across the disciplines in the humanities in previous conferences, I've always been struck by that and, you know, a historian looking at a particular theme or topic, um, you know, when they, when they get a perspective from somebody else who might be, you know, uh, working in the area of literature or modern languages or, um, you know, etc. Uh, you know, they, they do kind of can make connections and end up collaborating together on, on, on different things. Um, and I think as well, you know, Brendan has mentioned about a potential publication, I think as well, um, you know, having a, a publication bringing together different disciplines from, you know, under the umbrella of the humanities, you know, could be a fantastic contribution um, to, to several disciplines as well. So, um, again, just been a fantastic two days. I've really learned a lot uh, from each of the different panels. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the discussion on Twitter as well, it's been very lively and I'm sure that, you know, we will uh, keep the conversation going. So I'll, I'll just hand over and Brendan, just, uh, you know, to say as well, I really enjoyed working with the team. Um, it was a real uh, pleasure to work with you and, and your team over the last little while in, in pulling this together. And I think, I think it's been very successful. Thank All you. right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everyone else. Um, and uh, let me just say that, um, uh, this is perhaps the moment to bring our formal proceedings uh, to an end, although we can certainly continue to um, collaborate and communicate on the various media. <laughs> and that's what we do. And um, again, as, as um, Mel has pointed out, uh, you will soon see our... Um, uh, um, conference publication, hopefully, uh, and um, about which participants will be informed in due course. And meanwhile, uh, to quote a modern media figure, um, good night and good luck. Uh, and have a nice um, St. Patrick's Day. Best to all. <laughs>